that the, that the testing of your faith through experience produces endurance or that's something leading to spiritual maturity and inner peace. And let endurance or patience have its perfect result and do a thorough work so that you may be perfect and completely developed in your faith, lacking nothing. So that sounds a little bit complicated because there's a sequence of words. Be assured that the testing of your faith produces endurance or patience and that leads to maturity and then let the patience that you're gonna you're gonna draw from your experiences called life that is going to result in a perfect work and let that perfect work do its job so that you can be perfect and completely developed in your faith lacking nothing so on your notes there and I hope you follow me and and feel him the fire of experience is the difference between faith and proven faith everybody has faith and can say that they have faith everybody I have faith I believe I believe in God but there is a difference between faith and tested faith proven faith faith that has gone through something and in this life, we are all going to go through something. If it's not the cancer, it's the bankruptcy. It's the 14-year-old little girl becoming pregnant. It's the divorce. It's my son is telling me he is sexually disorientated. My daughter has weird inclinations. She disappears at night and comes back smelling like drugs or just the depression that sometimes comes in life because things are not the way they are supposed to be. Everybody, saint and sinner, Christian and not Christian, we all go through something. The difference between the Christian and the non-Christian is that the non-Christian thinks it's bad luck, thinks it's just something he's going through. The Christian knows it's the testing of our faith. And the difference between faith and tested faith is life's experiences. We are all going to cry. We are all going to not sleep certain nights. We are all going to weep. We are all going to feel depressed. We are all going to have dark days. Do you know that every one of us here is one text away from getting very bad news. We are one little connection on Facebook from getting bad news. We are all one stroke away from a stroke. Right now you can be happy, you've got your plans, your lunch plans after church, everything, but with one phone call, with one message, everything can change and that is where we need to be anchored to the rock which is Jesus Christ and know that if storms come, if hurricanes come, look at Houston, look at Miami, if earthquakes come to my life like in Mexico that I will be able to stand because my faith will be tested and I'm going to come through there with patience and endurance and I'm going to come out of there perfected like gold goes through the fire and comes out purified. Blessed be the name of Jesus. That's why the church learns to worship God before the trial, during the trial, and after the trial. Before my problem, during my problem, and after my problem. Before my storm, I praise my God. During the storm, and that's a tough one. That's a tough one. When you open the refrigerator and there's nothing in there and there's nothing in your wallet and your savings has dwindled and you've got to turn around to your kids and say, have faith, God is with us, we're going to be okay and you worship through that. Oh my goodness, that is tested and proven faith. Your faith, Peter says, your faith will be like gold that has been tested in a fire. And these trials will prove that your faith is worth much more than gold that can be destroyed. 
they will show that you will be given praise and honor and glory when Jesus Christ returns. Now, look at the sequence that we read in, first, in James 1, 3. Tested faith produces endurance. Endurance is something, you, if you're a runner, you know that you build up endurance. You start running uh, slow and short, and then you get faster and longer in your runs. And after three, six months of working out, of running, of jogging, you, you, you feel good when you're doing that second or third mile and you're not breathing that heavy. And you're not using your phone to call 911 or your wife to pick you up four blocks away from your house. Tested faith. You want to make it in this Christian walk? Your faith must be tested. There has to be trials. There must be temptations. There must be things in which we can fail. There must be things in which we will either believe or not believe God. But tested faith produces endurance. And then endurance produces maturity. You walk with the Lord enough. You just see what comes. You take the hit. And you say, glory be to God. You say, thank you, Jesus. You say, if, if they, they're coming to curse me, it's because you sent them. If this happens to me, something good must come out. A mature Christian isn't reacting at whims, is not answering to everything. You just learn how to stand. You learn how to live. You learn how to take it. You come to church. You, you come to the altar. You keep praying. You are mature because your tested faith produces endurance. Your endurance produces maturity. And maturity produces complete faith development. This faith that we have, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is believing on something you don't see. That's why when we believe in God who do, we do not see, we are exercising our faith. If I told you to believe in this pulpit, you, you, you see it. It's here. You can touch it. You don't need faith to believe in this pulpit. You need faith to believe in God. And this is a process of first coming to God, believing what your friends tells you the Bible says, and then reading it for yourself. And then you begin to have your own experiences. Our three friends who are going to be baptized today, you're beginning a journey of faith. You're here because of faith. You're here because you believe. And uh, if somebody told you, you get baptized and everything's going to be okay, they're lying. If anybody in your small group told you, you get baptized, no more problems, let me tell you, you will have more problems. Because before your faith wasn't tested, now it will be tested. And you learn to crawl. You learn to walk. You learn to jog. You learn to stand. You learn to be faithful through trials and tribulation, and then maturity will produce complete faith development. That's when you've got it in your spirit, and nobody is going to take it away from you. And then total faith produces lacking in nothing. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. A mature Christian isn't, I need this. I want this. You lack in nothing. Of course, normally you're going to buy a dress or, or a shirt or something. But I'm talking about high living, next level living, and next level faith. And let endurance have its perfect results and do a thorough work so that you may be perfect, completely, uh, completely developed in your faith, lacking nothing. Now, um, I want to tell you a story from the Old Testament. It's a, it's a neat story. One day, a king went to sleep troubled. The Bible seems to give us the idea that he fell asleep thinking what was going to happen after he died. What was going to happen to his kingdom, to his family, to his riches. It was King Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon. Uh, you'll find this story in the third uh, chapter, second and third chapters of Daniel. So he falls asleep and he has these nightmares. And he wakes up in the morning very perturbed in his spirit. And he calls his, his astrologers, his magicians, his counselors, his witches, his, war, his wise men. And he tells them something very interesting. He says, listen, I had this dream last night. And I need for you to give me the interpretation of my dream. And the wise men said, yes, yes, king, you tell us your dream and we will interpret it. Now, these were 
these were um, not all wise men. There was at least four of them who were wise men because these happened to be Hebrew children. Daniel, uh, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Name your kids that, I dare you. And, and so these guys weren't around at that time, it seems. So he, they said, tell us a dream, we'll give you the interpretation. And he says, no, 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 no. You tell me what I dreamed, and you give me the interpretation. And the men said, wait a minute, nobody has ever asked that. You give us the dream, and we'll tell you what it means. But nobody has ever asked for us to guess your dream. He says, you're just stalling, and he ordered the Bible says that his face was turned with wrath. He ordered all of the wise men to be put to death. He used to call them, I'm going to chop you up in little pieces. And so the word went out and the word got to Daniel and his three Hebrew friends that the king had ordered all the wise men and that included Daniel and his three friends. So Daniel, who's, who was filled of the, with the Spirit of God, Daniel, who was that young man who who purposed in his heart not to contaminate himself with the king's portion and who served God from his spirit. Daniel went to the king and he asked for an audience and he said, look king, I heard what you're going to do with us wise men who, who can't tell you your dream, much less interpret it. Give me some time. Give me some time. Oh, you know what? Just let me preach a little while here because, because there's times when we need to give God some time. There, there's times where you, before you buy the house, before you pick the school, before you pick the bride, before you pick the husband, before you do anything, you need to give God some time. Say, so give me some time. So Daniel runs back home. He tells his friends what's happening. And they started to pray before the Lord. And they started to worship him as the almighty, all-knowing, all-wise God. And they said, Lord, would you have mercy on us? And would you please give us the dream? And guess what? The Lord gave Daniel the dream and the interpretation. So he saves all the wise men and the non-wise men, he saves them all. And he comes back to the king. And he said, king, you went to bed troubled thinking about what was going to happen to you after you died. And you dreamt this statue that was huge. It had a head of gold. It had a, a chest of silver. It had bronze leg, iron ankles, and the feet were clay and iron mixed. And as you were watching that statue in your dream, you saw a big mountain being cut out with, without hands. And it came and it smashed at the feet of that statue. And then you woke up. And, and the king said, yes, yes, that's what it is. And Daniel said, this is what it means. He told them, he told them the meaning. The gold head is you, the, the Babylonic empire. And then the, 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 the silver chest... Uh, represents the Greek Empire, and then the bronze, the Roman, and, and on and on. And, and he, he told them the future of what was going to happen. And he said, wow, you're so smart. Your God's the best God. And he elevated Daniel to a position in the palace. And he also elevated his friends, Sadrach, Mesach, and Abednego. And he gave them a promotion. Well, the king kept thinking about this statue that just, it was, it was impressed in his spirit. But because he was a pagan man, he turned it toward idolatry. And he decided then to create this 90 foot by 9 feet statue, but made out of all gold. Can you imagine the, the, the weight of that statue and the value? And he had it erected 90 feet. Now this roof here is about, what is it, Patrick, 40? You built this place, help me out here. 40? So you can imagine 40 more feet and then 10 more and 9 feet wide. And then the king said, okay, I am going to invite everybody, all the princesses, every, all the people come and gather around this statue. He ordered musicians. He had a band ready. And he said, okay, at the sound of the music. And then the Bible there in chapter 3, it talks about all the instruments that were there. I want everybody to bow down and worship my statue. It was a statue that he had made to his God. And by worshiping his statue, he thought everybody was worshiping his God. It was his kingdom after all. And so the music played. Everybody falls and begins to worship this statue. And then jealous people 
who were jealous of Daniel, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the, he the, the Hebrew boys who had now elevated positions in the kingdom because they were wise, because God would give them the wisdom. Somebody comes and accuses them and says, King, oh King, may you live forever. Yes, what's going on? You're, you're messing up my party, my worship service here. What's going on? Did you not say that everybody at the sound of the music should bow down and worship your statue? Yes. Well, those three Hebrew boys who you elevated to high positions, they did not worship your statue. The king becomes angry. Now, we're talking about a little foolish person with a lot of authority. Girls, you never want to be married to a little foolish person with a lot of authority. Why did I say that? It must be the Holy Ghost. You never want to be, people with authority must be sound and mature. If, 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 you're, if you have authority, if you're a husband, if you're a boss, if, if you're a, a politician, if you're a pastor, if you're a minister, you have authority, but it must be managed with maturity. And this king, you know, it, it was not too long ago that, that Daniel, the Hebrew, interpreted his dream, gave him the dream, gave him the meaning, and who, he soon forgot that, and now he's turning to idolatry. So he brings Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he says, is it, is, is it true that you did not bow down and worship my idol? And because he liked these boys, he had a certain affinity to them because he respected them. He said, I am going to give you one more chance, which is something unheard of in the Chaldean Empire. It was called the law of the Medes and, the, and Persia, that when the king said something, that's it. It was, no, I'm sorry, let's go to the office, let's talk about it, let's make an appeal, and let's fill out the paperwork. No, sir. He said it, you die. But he told him, I am going to give you another chance to worship my idol. And the boys said this. They said, um, you don't have to worry, king. We're not going to worship your idol. And the king said, if you do not worship the idol, I am going to cast you in a furnace. Now, a furnace where you bake pizzas, bread. But that was his way of punishing people. He said, if you do not, I will cast you in the furnace. And the boy said, listen, if you do not, if, if, if we're not going to worship your God, our God, Jehovah, is able to save us from your furnace. But if he doesn't save us, we will still not worship your idol. And in your notes here, this Next level faith, I'm just going to give you three of them. Next level faith demands even if he doesn't resolve or all in. You know, God doesn't answer every one of our prayers. If God answered every one, I was told now I'm hot. I must be going through menopause or something. <laughs> Mature faith is faith that says, I believe you can do it. But if you don't do it, I will still praise your name and I will serve you. Can you imagine these three boys staring back at this, at this angry king who is now heating up the, the furnace sevenfold, seven times. Put more wood, put more coal in there. He's, 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 he's angry and you can see his anger. Why would anybody need to reheat the furnace or, or heat it seven times more? I mean, fire is fire, isn't it? It's going to burn them. It's going to kill them anyway. But he is so angry. And, and the boys have resolved. He can save us. If he doesn't, we're still not going to worship. We're still going to worship our God. That's the kind of faith, next level faith, God wants to bring us up. Where if he heals me, praise his name. If he doesn't heal me, praise his name. If I can recuperate my business from the brink of bankruptcy because I prayed to God, praise his name. If I lose it all, praise his name. I was hearing, uh, was, is it Adrian Otto pray this morning at our, at our meeting? 
uh, Adrian, there he is right there. Wave, wave, Adrian. And he's praying. And we had a prayer meeting, went around the table and prayed. And he said, Lord, everything you do is for a reason. And you give and you take away. And I'm still going to serve you. And those of us who know the story know that not too long ago, he just buried his baby. But he's faithful. He's there. If you heal my baby, I'm going to praise you. If you take my baby, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to praise you. That's the... Even if he doesn't do it, resolve that we need. That's next level faith. How many people, well, I prayed to God and he didn't answer. So why should I serve God? And I'm, I'm disappointed and I'm, I feel down and God doesn't hear me. God hears even your snoring. God hears everything. God knows everything. But he doesn't. Sometimes people think that, that prayer is this little uh, a thing that you get God in a headlock. And you say, you better do this. God doesn't have to do anything. He doesn't have to bless me. But he does. Guess what? If I give my tithe, like all of you will in October, can you say hallelujah, praise the Lord? You say, well, then is God going to bless me? He doesn't have to bless you. He has already blessed you with life, with liberty. He's, and so we put these ifs, conditions. If you do this, God, I will do this. And God is looking for somebody that has next level faith who says, you know what? He's powerful, King. You're nothing to my God. I, right now, I'm in your hands. If you throw me in that fire, I will become a chicharron, cucaracha, whatever you want to call it. I, I will become just an ash, but I will serve my God. I will not bow down to your idol. I want to know if the church has been bowing down to idols that make themselves present in our life. Let us serve God with all of our heart, with all of our mind. Doesn't matter what kind comes. I saw some pictures of some of my friends uh, waist deep in water walking in their churches who are now, who are now, the churches who are now, which are now destroyed. And you know what they were doing? They're praising God with water up to here. Why didn't God move the hurricane that way? Why didn't God put the earthquake out there? I don't know. That's God's doing. But all I know is that there are some people who have resolved. You're going to serve God if you get cancer. You're going to serve God if your baby dies. You're going to serve God if your house falls out. If heaven and earth pass away, I'm still going to serve God. Oh, hallelujah. That's just that quiet resolve that I'm going to have. The God we worship, Daniel 3.17, can save us from you and your flaming firmness. But even if he doesn't, we still won't worship your gods and the gold statue that you have set up. Well, what happens? Precisely that. He still gave him another chance. The music came out of the band stand and... Uh, you think the king was looking at anybody else? You've got, you've got the king there with gnarly soldiers and big mean guys all around him. All of his security patrol around him. And, and when the music plays, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're like this. Standing in the middle of the fiery trial. So the king orders, the Bible says, some of his biggest guards. These are just Hebrew children, unarmed. But he gets them, fires up the furnace seven times more. Watch what the Bible says. They put him in, they, they cast them in the furnace. And the flames were so strong that the flames leapt out and killed the soldiers who were pushing them in. You talk about God. They tied them up. And they put them in the fire with their tunics, their turbans, their, their, their you know, for, so you guys can understand, their little uh, dodger caps. Angel caps, all, all their stuff they were wearing, they throw them in the fire and they sit back and the king is now vindicated. He says, that's what you get if you don't obey me and serve my God. Watch what happens. And I call this next level faith puts God in the middle of your situation. And if the other one was all in, this is all God. Suddenly the king jumped up and shouted, weren't only three men tied up and thrown in the fire? Yes, your majesty, the people answered, but I see four men walking around in the fire. The king replied, none of them is, is tied up or harmed. And the fourth one looks like a God. 
When you and I are faithful to God and we stand up to idolatry and we have resolve and faith and an old word some of us already forgot, it's called convictions. It's called doing the right thing when nobody's looking. It's doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. It's talking right, dressing right, doing right because we have convictions. Convictions are not movable by circumstances. It's what I am. That's the next level faith God wants us to have. I don't act one way with a set of friends and then act another way with another set of friends. I am who I am. I serve my God. I have conviction. They're going to mock you. You talk about it. These guys went into the fire. Some of us don't want to be talked bad by our friends. We're going to be shunned. They're not going to invite us anymore. So what? Stand up. Be salt. Be light. Be different. We are not of this world. We're just passing by. This world is not my home. And the only thing that burned in the fire was the ropes that had him tied. And sometimes, listen to this. This is an important principle. Sometimes the only reason that God allows you to go through the fire is to burn off things that have you tied. That, that a sermon is not going to do it. Man, I preach here twice every week. And three, four times around the world during the week. Most of the weeks. And if, if one sermon could do it, believe me, believe me, I, 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 I would... I would even do it better or more or whatever. But it's not going to be a sermon. It, it, your father, your mother can talk to you. Your wife can counsel you. Your husband can advise you. Uh, your friends can. And, and sometimes God says, he doesn't listen here. He doesn't listen here. I will allow the fire of the furnace to, to burn that has, which has had him bound and tied up. And it's going to be an experience of faith where you, when you believe in God. And years ago, I wake up in the middle of the night. My wife is not there. And she had had her sixth or seventh chemo treatment. And she had lost her hair and gone through almost a whole year of all that stuff. And I look for her and she's not there and I get up. And I hear this whimpering from the closet. And I walk over there and she's bent down. You know what she's doing? She's praising the Lord. She's thanking God. I said, oh my goodness. And if you, can, if you can praise God through the fire, if you can trust God through the fire, you'll find out that he will be with you in the fire. And you don't want anybody else there but God. When, when the doctor says there's no more hope, you want him in the fire. When, when the counselor said this marriage is over, you want him in the fire. When the marriage is over, you want him in the fire. When you can't find your boy and you're looking around in prisons and hospitals, you want him in the fire. I want him in the fire. And, and the king is there and he says, wait a minute, wait a minute. These guys aren't burning. And how many did we throw in there? How come there's four? And the fourth one looks like a god. Oh, you, many times you don't see him, but he's there. He's there if you're faithful to him. You know what? Anybody can sing on a, on a, on a sunny day with Butterflies and birds chirping and rainbows and I was going to say unicorns, but nah. <laughs> and the last one, next level faith promotes you to the next level of blessing. It's all in, it's all God, and it's all good. It's all good. After this happened... The king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in Babylon. And he takes them out and he says, the God that these guys serve, 
Nobody make fun of him. Nobody say bad things about him. He's the real God. He's the real God. And Nebuchadnezzar got three experiences with God. The dream, the furnace experience. And in the next chapter, he has another dream, which is real interesting. You might want to read Daniel today. It's very interesting. He, he had a dream about a tree, but that's a whole different subject. When you go through the fire, when you're willing to go all in, even if he doesn't. You, you know how many prayers God has not answered? Do you know how many times I have, I have, <laughs> I've used my leverage with God. God, this is the pastor here. Okay, it's not like little Pancho over there. No, no, this is the pastor. And in case you haven't noticed, God, I am also a bishop. I've got my cards. Are you going to hear me or not? There's three answers to prayer. There's yes, there's no, and there's a wait. And if you learn that, you will walk in next level faith. That's what you want, God? That's what we'll do. But do me a favor. Walk with me. Be with me. And then your next season is going to be next level blessing. And the boys who accused Cedric, Misad, Nebuchadnezzar of not bowing down, now they became their boss. And I can imagine uh, Sadrak Monday morning. Hey, bring me some coffee to the guy who accused him. No, no, I want decaf. Can you, can you go to Starbucks and give me a macarada, kakalaka, whatever you guys order? I don't know what it is. Can you go give me one of those? Don't you think it's time to reach next level faith? I want to call not everyone. I want to call people who are currently going through the fire right now. Just going through a problem in your life. Maybe a sickness, an unemployment, a bankruptcy, a, a situation in your life. I want to pray for you. And if everybody would just bow their heads, I want to call those people, even if there's three or five or 20, you're going through the fire. You're safe here. It doesn't matter. We all go through the fire. Come right here, sister.